England, the county of Bedfordshire, in the south, a place called Cranfield. We landed at an aerodrome that looked like any other drome, an open space to fly in and out of, fringed by hangars. But it's the home of the only university of its kind in the world, the Empire Test Pilot School. The best pilots from all parts of the world, chosen by their governments, have taken this school's specialized course in test piloting. Design and mechanism are changing fast. The world waits for signs that flying will be a safe transport. And before blueprint theory can become safe practice, the paper ideas have to be tested in the sky. In the mess we find some of the 45 students. A Dutch Army Air Force captain, an English squadron leader who lost an eye in fighter command, and a Canadian flight lieutenant were getting to know each other. A United States Army Air Force colonel was already differing quietly with an English civilian pilot on the merits of a certain aircraft. These are the world's best pilots. Already over 40 men from the earlier courses have gone to jobs with aircraft manufacturers as staff test pilots. China, Canada, Greece, Ireland, America, Britain, together for nearly a year. And standing in the fireplace, the school's commander, Group Captain Wilson, talking with young Flight Lieutenant Duke, one of the team which in September 1946 broke the world's speed record. Before that, Wilson himself was the fastest man on Earth in 1945, he did 606 miles an hour in a meteor jet plane. In charge of the flying part of the course is Wing Commander Smith, joined the Air Force 12 years ago, a flight commander during those hectic days of the Battle of Britain. Later, squadron leader of night fighters. Has already put in many years instructing. He's 32 years old. The test pilot's course takes nine months and is divided into two parts. One half concentrates on finding out how the different planes handle in the air. That means each student flying many kinds of aircraft under different conditions. The other half is the testing of planes' natural performances and measuring and recording their characteristics. That means much desk work and mathematics. Responsible for training the students are five English staff instructors. Four of them take on a group of students each and put them through the flying program. These are veteran flying men. Squadron leader Titch Havercroft has 1,000 hours test flying experience. Their average age is about 33. Squadron leader Hobley, AFC, has flown 46 types of aeroplane. These men have instructed other flying men in all parts of the world. Then there's Mr. McLaren Humphreys, chief technical instructor in charge of all classroom tuition. He's an authority on physics, aerodynamics and mathematics, has 10 years experience in the test flying of aircraft. It is on his groundwork that the flying instructors build their practical tuition of how to test a plane. It was morning, eight o'clock and the students arrived for their lecture. Havercroft went off to do an experimental flight to keep up his own flying hours. The daily lecture for the students is earlier, so that after the desk work there is still a full day's flying. Because in England, in the summer, every daylight hour counts. The speed of an aircraft is calculated by measuring the pressure of air as the aircraft travels through it. The lecture is on the positional error test, full of technical terms, but to us it simply means the measurement of the error in the height and airspeed indicators, which both depend on the pressure of the atmosphere for their working. To measure the pressure of the atmosphere on an aircraft, a tube is fixed on the outside of all planes. But the air that is rushing past a plane in motion is bound to disturb the ordinary atmosphere around the aircraft. Hence, the reading on the instrument panel will always be wrong, says the lecturer. How wrong depends on the position of the tube. 
the position error is established for every type of aircraft. The day came when the test was to be practiced on one of the fastest planes in the world, the Meteor twin-engine jet. The pilot was one of the American students, Lieutenant Warren P. Smith from the United States Naval Reserve. Meanwhile, four other students and the instructor made their way to the top of the control tower to take their part in the test. The instrument that measures the atmosphere pressure, called an altimeter, is placed on the control tower. Another altimeter is placed in the plane, and if undisturbed, would read the same as the one in the control tower. It won't, because it's connected to that exterior tube on the plane, and the rushing air will affect it. The difference between the two altimeter readings is what the pilot is trying to find out. So that everything else is equal, the plane must fly at the same height as the observer's altimeter, about 50 feet above the ground, along a runway past the tower. will fly past twice, at 120 miles an hour for the slow run, and then at 400 miles an hour. A wire frame enables the observers to check that the pilot flies his altimeter at the correct height. The middle wire is 50 feet above the ground. Each wire above or below represents 10 feet higher or lower. And flying a jet plane 50 feet from the ground is no picnic. Here he comes for the first run. Bang on the button. The next run will be at 400 miles an hour. At that speed, 50 feet from the ground, the slightest error means he's had it. with him a record of the altimeter readings at the different speeds. Humphreys compares them with the readings he took on the control tower. The difference tells them to what extent the position of that tube allows moving air pressure at speed to interfere with the atmospheric pressure reading. The degree of the inaccuracy at any given speed will be constant on the type of aircraft tested and can be allowed for on the dial readings whenever height and speed have to be quickly calculated. That knowledge may save lives. Time passes quickly at Cranfield, a lot to do, a lot to learn in nine months for the 45 students. April, May, positional error tests. June, July, partial climbs. Maximum climbing power is different from maximum speed. Find the speed which gives the maximum rate of climb and put on a graph. August, stick and unstick. Take off, that's when you know what you're flying. 10 yards, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. She soars like a bird. September, spinning and other aerobatic tests. The object of this test is to find out the spinning characteristic of the plane and the best method of recovery. The plane should recover from such a spin on application of a standard method. The height loss should not exceed 3,000 feet. During the recovery, the elevator and rudder control forces necessary should be less than 80 pounds and 150 pounds respectively. Dihedral effect. Lateral instability. Oscillation instability. Find out cause of snaking. 
Weber, asymmetric handling, flying aircraft straight with engine trouble. Now, if one engine or multi-engine aircraft fails, what are the immediate effects? An aircraft's smooth flight in the air depends on balance. Balance between natural forces and the forces created by the plane itself as it goes through the air. If an engine fails, the overall balance is affected even if the plane has other engines working. This unbalance has to be corrected quickly by the controls. Lieutenant Liu of the Chinese Air Force asks whether the aeroplane will always slip one way. And Mr. Miles, a civilian pilot from Australia, wants to know if rudder and ailerons alone can always keep a plane straight. He already had the phenomenally high record of 15,000 flying hours to his credit. Miles as pilot and Lou as observer were down to do an asymmetric test flight on a Lancaster. There are over 40 operational switches alone on a lag, and it's best to know they work before you go up. He gives a routine check to the rudder and aileron controls. They're going to be important on this test. Lancaster weighs 22 tons. It has a wing spread of over 100 feet. To an experienced pilot, it's the safe carriage of the air. But it's designed with four engines, and if one goes out of action, something is bound to happen to that balance. Air Group Commander Titch Havercroft has given them instructions. Take her up to about 4,000 feet, then cut the outer starboard motor. Watch how much aileron and rudder control is necessary to keep her climbing. Then land with one motor dead and watch for side slip. In the control tower, Titch can keep in touch with the flight and have a chin wag with the control officer. observer to prepare to feather. The plane continues climbing, awaiting the order to feather. Pilot, starboard outer motor feathered. Time to feather, six seconds. engine feathers. Roger out. landing on 
three engines. As the course progresses, differences of custom and language are dissolving in the mutual interest of a highly specialized branch of living. These men will be the test pilots of the future. They will make flying safer. The use to which that flying is put for peace or war seems to depend on whether the old knowledge that walks behind our hearts can keep pace with the new knowledge that is speeding through the minds of men.